Good evening. Hopefully everyone is doing well. <clears throat> Looks at least like there's a couple people in here. So that's good. All right. Let me actually clean my glasses. It looks, appears to be a, a little dirty. <clears throat> um, I finished grading assignment three, and I will immediately start in on assignment four. I also have the exam out there, so let me talk about that for a minute. So the way I've decided it is, uh, is that because it's a take home, you're allowed to actually uh, use whatever resources you'd like. The only thing that I ask is that you, is that you inform me, and the last question is for you to inform me, of who and what you used. So please keep track of that as you're going through the exam. Um, it should take you um, maybe a couple hours, maybe not. Some of you will get through quicker than that, but it's it's going to it's going to be pretty in, pretty intensive. Um, make sure you're giving me everything that you can do, uh, all the little details, everything, because um, I, don't assume that I know. And again, I'm not looking for the right answer. I'm looking for the process. Um, a few of the questions aren't necessarily process related. But they are, uh, you know, they're asking you for to describe something. So go ahead and go into as much detail as you feel is necessary. Okay, um, but while grading assignment three, I realized a few things, um, and that is the first thing is when you're doing a truth table, you really shouldn't jump steps. So let me do an example. And I'll show you what I'm talking about here. So let's go X and Y. Now some of you did a really fabulous job on these truth tables, so I, you're, you're not the ones I'm talking to. But it's good to review some of this anyways. You should always use this, in a truth table, you should always use this. You start with zero and X and go and you know work your way up, and then Y goes the, the same way work your way so it's it's as if you're counting numbers right and if I had a Z I would deal with that as well so let's let me look here and go uh, let's say uh, X Y plus X Y and then let's do that see what happens so, and I'm going to, I have no idea whether this will look good or not, what it'll even come out to be. It could end up being just completely negated. I don't, I don't know. Okay, so one of the ways we're going to do this is I noticed here there's an X knot and a Y knot. And a lot of times I like to do those first. You don't have to, but I like to do them first. Because they're easy and it's easy to refer back to this X then. And I just refer to that X and that allows me to be able to do that quickly. The same thing with why not. Now I don't know where to go, so I'm just going to start with the very first thing. And I'm combining two things only. You should never combine more than two. So I saw some of you would go to like something like, um, you know, like an XYZ and then grab three of them. It's not bad if you're just doing three uh, and it's in an and situation or an or situation. It's probably not horrible to do that. But generally speaking, I want to see the process, right? So let's go ahead and take two at a time. So, so don't do any more than that. Right, so now here I would go, what, zero, 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 one. And then the next one I'm going to do is X not Y. And so then I can just look at these two columns and they're anded together. So that second spot is the only one that's going to turn on. And then I'm going to do X not and Y not. And that will be a one in the first spot, 
but the rest of the spots are zeros. All right, so now let's do this back half here and say x not y or x not y not. So it's these two here in an or situation, so it'll be one one zero zero zero. Oh no no. It's in an and situation, isn't it? Well, if we're in an and situation, right, this is zeros all the way down. Okay. That's interesting. That tells us something. And then finally here, I can just, in this case, I can just put an F there, and that's for the full function. That's the whole thing. So I need to take this one here and this one here, and I'm going to OR those. So and the good news is it's the exact same as the first element because the second element is, is zeros all the way down. Let's change this and put this here just to make it a little bit more interesting, which case... We have that or there. So then this will be a one, this will be a one, and then we'll get a couple ones here. And that gives us our function. Now, yeah. So one of the next things is, and I didn't include this in the assignment, but I probably should have, is that you need to, when you're going through and showing your work, you should do one step at a time only. You should never make jumps. And I think several, so quite a few of you actually started, made some jumps in a couple of them. So don't do that. What you want to do is one step at a time. So one step per line and make it as simple as possible. But think about it this way. Uh, pretend that I'm just not that smart. That might even be true. You might even think that that's true. And that's okay. I don't mind. but pretend that I'm just not that smart because what you're doing with these assignments and the exam is you're trying to prove to me that you know what you're talking about. And when you make jumps, it makes it look like it's possible that you went out online and just type, type this into some, some kind of a... Uh, uh, you know, some kind of a calculator that actually automatically does it for you. And that's really great unless you don't have access to that calculator or it's something that that calculator can't do. So I know that that for a lot of you that you kind of make an assumption that um, you don't need to be a good thinker or not, let, me, let me back that up. That you, like you don't need to do, know how to do math, right? It's like, oh, I don't need to know how to do math. I can just use my calculator. Or you know somebody that's like that. Well, well, that might be true. The thing is, is the process of learning how to do math helps you understand and be a better thinker. Because sometimes there are problems that aren't solved, that have to be solved. And that includes even at my job, right? I'm not really doing any innovative, super innovative code, but... There are times when I have to figure out how to make something work giving existing stuff. And sometimes we're, we're using different modules from different places and we're integrating them in a unique way that no one else is. Or they don't really want to share with me because, you know, they're our competitor. So just just keep that as a, as a note out there is that most of the time... In computer science especially, when you're in education, what you're doing is you're doing really simple programs. They're easy. But in the real world, you very rarely do easy things. Usually are doing much more complicated things. And so you're going to have to think about them and, and work on them. So develop that part of your brain that requires you to think. And I think most of you are buying into that, but I'm just I'm just putting that out there as, as something that's important. Okay. Also, you might very well run into a pointy-haired boss. 
Um, for those of you who aren't aware, right, that, that would refer back to our Dilbert comics. Um, and in Dilbert, the Dilbert comics, his Dilbert is an engineer, which we're all hoping to be. Well, I guess I already am, but, but the rest of you are hoping to be an engineer, software engineer, at some point in your careers. And you're going to have a manager. And sometimes that manager doesn't have any idea what you're doing. They don't have any clue. And, and, and the Dilbert comic is really just a, uh, uh, an abstraction in some ways of a lot of those kinds of things. But many, many engineers find, this, find it very funny to, to watch or to listen to or read. Um, and I can say that there are times I've, I've read them and, and laughed. Um, I don't diligently read them by any means. Okay, so that's that one. The next one here is I want to talk about is I want to talk about your guys' um, the De Morgan's Law because I don't think I did a very good job of explaining it. And, and I understand, that, and the reason I'm saying that now is because I saw what you guys turned in. And some of you did a reasonably good job. And others of you just, it felt like you, you missed it. And let me, so let me, let me open up our assignment three, and I'm going to grab it from here. I think I should be able to do this. Yep. Okay. Oh, can I bring that in here? I cannot. Maybe I can. I paste it in. No, that's not very helpful. No, okay. Oh, jeez. Okay, so let's just take this this function, x z prime, x y plus x z close parenthesis plus x y prime x z plus y. If it's not exactly the same as the, the homework, that's okay. It doesn't really matter. I could do a couple things that are different. But one of the things it says is to take the complement of that. And maybe I didn't talk about that, and so maybe it wasn't on it was kind of a little bit unfair to you. But you certainly could have looked up complement, so I'm not I'm not gonna be too apologetic about that. Or you could have asked a question to me about that. So That's the complement. I take the whole thing and I give it a, a negation. All right, now, so when I look at this, I say, where's the central point? That's, this is kind of how I think about it. I say, where's the central point? Well, the central point, there's kind of two halves, right? There's this first half that's all ands. There's a kind of a thing in parentheses with another thing outside the parentheses that's, they're anded together. And then on the second half, that we do the same thing, except for we flip where the parentheses are. Oh no, they're still in the back, I guess. So the the main thing, oops, is right here. Right, that's an or. So I'm going to use the and version of De, De Morgan's law. So let's let me let me do De Morgan's here. And so a uh, or b equals. A not, B not. So, and then we can do the exact same thing. A, B, not equals A not or B not. And that's exactly how it's written and, and it works. Now, the thing that's a little tricky is that sometimes it's not in the exact form. So we have to kind of do a little bit of uh, uh, jumping through hoops. And maybe that was where I, I made my mistake in des describing this is that what I'm going to do is I'm going to break this down a little bit here. I'm going to say A is equal to let me let me actually not do an equal sign here. Let's do this. Get my blue here. I'm going to call this A. I'm going to call this 
B. Okay, so then I can say, well, this is in the A or B, and the whole thing is has a knot on the outside of it. Hey, that looks exactly like, like this one here, doesn't it? Like number one. Call this one and this two. Doesn't really matter. <clears throat> I'm just labeling them. It makes it easier to talk about it. All right, so what I can do then is I can take and put this first half, A, because I know what A looks like. So it's going to be A. Oh, I don't want to put the A there because I'm going to replace everything with the A. So, so here's my transition. I could say A, not B, not. Right? That's what this is going to come out to be. That's, the, that's what the formula says. Okay. So then uh, now I'm going to replace A and B and, and put, the, uh, put the, everything back in there. So the X, Z, X, Y, plus X, Z. And then I'm going to put a knot on the, out, on the outside of it. That's it. And now this is multiplied together, so I can put a dot there to just remind myself if I want. It doesn't really matter. So then it, uh, it's useless. It doesn't make a difference. It just helps me remember. So it's optional. Maybe that's a better way. It's not useless. It's optional. Okay, so there's that parenthesis. I always want to be really careful to make sure I don't miss a parenthesis or have an open... Oh, look, see, I did that here, right? It's a perfect example. I have these, this set, right? This set, the red set. But then the green one here, this first green one, doesn't have a close. So I need a close for that right there. Okay. Now, I'm just going to focus on doing the first half here, and I see, oh, hey, look, this looks like, that's it, my new A, that's my new B. Boy, that's in form two. And then here, I'm going to call this one C. and this one D. And I'm going to include the knot into the C. So I'm, that way I can stuff it in there and I don't have to think about it. Okay, which means then I'm going to have X, Z, or, ah, but I need to put parentheses around that because I need to put a knot on that. Oh, and then I need a knot on the Z. Yeah, let me erase that and do it better. or A or B now, so what happens to this? Well that wasn't in A or B, but if we look over, or what happens to the, the, um, the not symbol, right? So I look over here to this, well that's there, but it disappears on the other side, right? It's gone. Okay, so we don't need it, but we do need to have a knot on B, which is inside the parentheses here. Okay, so then we have the other side. And I could put brackets around this like this. And then do it again here. And I think everyone kind of understands the gist. I'm not going to finish this, but that's the way to think about this. And that really, really help. That really helps me think about it is by by mentally putting these things into into spots, into variables, so that I can abstract it. Remember, I've talked about that before. Abstraction, right? Okay. All right, so let's jump in now and start talking about the new, some of the new content. I don't know if there was anything else on that that didn't make sense, or that uh, that I thought needed a little work. So let me see here. 
pull that off to the side here. Uh, choo -choo, choo -choo, choo -choo. No, I don't think there was really um, anything too too wild beyond that. Everything was pretty straightforward. Um, most people did fairly well on that. So, okay. All right, so one thing that I haven't talked about yet, and that is interrupts. Actually, I have talked about them. I've talked about them, but I haven't talked about them formally. Their events. that alter the normal flow of execution. Okay, so let me let me explain that just to maybe a, a hair more. So when you load up a program, it's just it's you know you, you make the assumption that it's just going to run for the whole time. But let's think about right. Your cell phone is a computer, right? So that that's is perfectly fine to work on this. So you're on your cell phone and your you know, maybe you're you're watching uh, you're watching a YouTube video, or maybe you're on you know a, some kind of a streaming service, and you're watching some other kind of video. It doesn't matter. You're watching some kind of video, and so that video is playing, and that's the normal flow of execution. Is the video is sitting there playing for you, but then you get a text message. That's an interrupt. And maybe it plays a sound, or maybe it vibrates. It depends on how your phone's set up, right? So that's an interrupt. But sometimes interrupts come in that aren't that the computer doesn't necessarily have to do anything visible to the user. What would be an example of that? Um. Trying to think of one that's good. Well, there are interrupts that are actually happening all the time on the computer that I'm currently using that, that don't necessarily affect me. Once per second, the computer is updating the clock in the bottom right-hand corner of the screen. You can't quite see it because uh, the program I'm using cuts that off. If I click on this, maybe it'll open up. Yeah, it opens it up part way, but not a lot, not completely. And that, that cut, it's cut off by my picture. Let's see, can I move that picture around? I can. There we go. Move that picture around here. I need to move it over a little bit more. Now you guys can see it. Maybe. Did that not work? Yep, yeah, okay, it did work. Okay, good, good. So, right, so if we look here, in my normal flow of information, and my mouse moving around to the screen, but here's the thing that's actually pretty cool. Every time the mouse moves, that's another interrupt. Because something could be going on, and you know, right, your video could be going on, and you move your mouse around. You know, if you're on your cell phone, you might tap the screen. That's an interrupt. It's the normal flow of information is just go ahead and play the video, but when you click on the screen, then, or touch the screen, actually I should say that prob prob properly because it's not a click, right, it's a touch. And so when you touch the screen, that is an interrupt that changes how things work. Now, it's important to note that there's different kinds of interrupts because sometimes an interrupt, in fact, there's a common interrupt that we use in our software 
and that is a log. And so when you're, you're using the website, because that's what we're maintaining for the most part, is a website. When you do something on that website, we log that. Not everything, but a lot of things. And so those things get logged, and you don't see it, but it's happening on the server behind the screens. Or behind the scenes, sorry, not screens. So that that's just something to, to think about, right? Those are interrupts. But the computer had to, to pause to deal with that. Uh, and in some ways, that's normal flow. And so that's a little different. But what happens if it runs into a null pointer exception? How does it deal with that? Or a, who knows, right? I mean, there's a lot of different problems. What happens if, because if, we're using Java, so that that's part of the nomenclature for Java. But if an exception happens that's going to crash the program, well, what do we do, right? So it, it has a certain way to deal with that. And sometimes it won't crash the program. It'll just mess the program up for a bit. And so then we have to communicate to the user some way. So th these, are, these are things that go along with it. So sometimes it's, I don't, you guys don't need to be looking at my clock the whole time. So uh, sometimes this is, uh, sometimes they're, they're useful and sometimes they're one not. And what the book calls it is masking and unmasked or masked and unmasked. I guess I've never really heard about them talked about that way, but that's a, that's not a bad way to think about it. Okay, let me move my picture back. Ah, that's not what I wanted to move. Well, there we go. Get my picture back to where it's where it's supposed to be, so I can. How do I do this? I can look down and see what the interrupts are doing. Oh, that's actually kind of funny. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, so I talked about registers some time, yeah, before, right? So one of the things is each bit in a register is is probably instituted by a D flip flop. That's typically what's used in modern technology. So th the things that we're actually studying are the building blocks. Those flip-flops, that's a building block of our um, program. All right, so but what I want to do now actually then is I wanted to say that about reg the registers, that each one is probably a D flip-flop. Um, actually, let me, let me look that up. Let's see if we can get a good... A good picture of a D flip flop. And this is Wikipedia for what it's worth. Oh, that's a flip flop. I want the D flip flop. Flip flop types SR, SR Nash, JK. D. Here's our D flip-flop. Just a straight D. Uh, what's the E stands for? This latch, so latch is another word for flip-flop, exploits the fact, that fact, exploits that fact. What fact does it exploit? The enable input is, oh, it's sometimes, it's called a signal clock. But more often, a read and write strobe. Okay. Latch is said to be level sensitive to the level of the, uh, as opposed to edge sensitive, like flip flops below. Uh, oh, no, no, no. The la this latch exploits the fact that in the two active input conditions, 0, 1, and 1, 0, of a gated SR latch, R is the complement of S, and input NAND, or not AND, stage converts the two D input states, 0 and 1, to these two input combinations for the next SR latch by, inv by inverting the data signal. Okay, that's actually, that's actually kind of cool. Okay, so notice here, then we've got this clock, that's 
helping us out, right? And, and so it's telling us when to read the flip-flop, basically. And so we see here that we have the not version of it. So we flip it over, and that's going to be our S. And then we're going to not flip it over, and we're just going to use the whatever the raw is. And that's our R. And so that goes into our R flip-flop. Our R or our SR flip-flop. <clears throat> right, and then it goes in and flops. So that the Q here, if this is a one, oh, actually we can look here. This is a great example. So this is, let's let's call uh, the animated uh, black and white logical zero and one. So a black is a one and a zero is, uh, is a white. So it comes in with a black, we have to watch when the black goes. Okay. At some point. Maybe. Oh. Oh, that's not helpful. All right. Well, let's look at what a white happens when, when it sets it to zero. Oh, great. Now it's going to go black and black and black and black and black. All right. So let's look black here. So it flips that over to the white. And then we've got an and between those two things to see if it's working. And then here we do the same thing, except for this is just the direct one. And then no, the two nor gates, so not an or. So when this comes out here, right, then it splits and goes to Q, and then it goes into this nor gate for the next one. And if you'll notice that those are going to, they lap up. And so this is actually a really nice way to, to see it. Oh, that's right, I can't. You guys can't see my mouse. Oh, uh, wait, yeah, you can see my mouse, can't you? Okay, I was thinking you couldn't. All right, good. All right, so that's, that's a D flip-flop, and each one of those is actually in the registers, so... It's a lot of circuits just to keep track of one bit of information, isn't it? Yes. Everything is complicated. Everything is complicated. But it's simple because it's repetitive. Okay. So now I want to start talking about actually how Maria works. Where's my mouse at? And, and I'm going to talk about Well, first off, what does it mean? Machine architecture. That is really intuitive and easy. Okay. This is my CPU. I'm going to draw it similarly to the way they draw it in the book. Just so no one gets confused. Although I don't know that you would. Okay. And then over here. This will be our main memory. I'm just going to call it memory.
Here's our ALU. Well, maybe I should go in some kind of order. Yep, okay. An AC, that's accumulator. So the accumulator is the is it's a register, it's a single register, sometimes it's multiple ones, but it's a single register in this case that holds the thing we're currently working with. And you'll see that in play as we move through this and do some of these things. Okay. And over here, I have an MAR. And it's not connected to anything. Oh, yes, it is. It's connected to the main memory. And the MAR is a memory address register. So that's the address of the memory we're going to locate over here in the memory. And its pair, there's a one something goes with it. M B R. So when we load something from memory, we're actually going to stick it into the MBR. That's the memory buffer register. And so sometimes that gets loaded in from the MBR into there, and sometimes it comes out from the accumulator out into the MBR. Also, sometimes it goes straight into the ALU. And we'll talk about how that works as we go along through this a little bit more. Okay. Where's that? Okay, so, ah, but we have a control unit. We know we have a control unit here, right? Control unit. So this one is a PC. That's a program counter, and what that does is it keeps track of where we are in our program. So are we on line 5, or are we on line 10, or 100, and, and that's in a, in a machine code. And so it's in actual memory locations. And, ah, and then the, the we have the IR. So this is the instruction register. Oh, those. We're getting close to being done. <laughs> so the IR is instruction register. So this is the register. So, okay, when... When an instruction comes in to the, to the CPU, goes to the control unit, the control unit pulls off the instruction register or the instruction, whatever the instruction is, and stores it here. That then can be referenced by somebody, the ALU, to figure out what it's supposed to do. So when it when it comes time for it to execute something, it looks here in the IR, and then it knows what, what it's supposed to do. Okay. And we have two more. output register I'm just going to call it reg or register and so that stores any information that's leaving the CPU it's stored in here and I bet you can guess that this is the input register connected here.
So the input register would be where, if, if we have to fetch something up from memory or from storage, right, because storage is even farther away, then it will come in and go into the input register. And then the ALU can bring that in, stick it in the accumulator, and then potentially store it back out, push it back out, or do something else with it. Okay. This will help us now to understand the next part here. Mm. Okay. So I'm going to go through and start talking about, there's really six, there's only 16 different things. There's only 16 of them. And after the end of 16, we don't have to do anything more, right? That's all. That's all there are. Okay. So I'm going to start with the first one. Load X. In all cases, X denotes a memory location. So the first thing that X would be done is it would be stored, whatever the value is for X, it'll be stored in the MAR. And then that'll go out here and it'll figure out where to, uh, you know, to where, you know, that it'll go to whatever position here in memory. It'll grab that information and it'll bring it in. Ah, okay. So that's actually, this is nice. MAR. This is a way to, to show that X gets put into the MAR. Oops. MBR gets the memory at MAR. So it's going to go out to that memory location, grab whatever's there based on the address in the MAR, and it's going to store it back in the MBR. And then then the accumulator gets what's ever in the MBR. So we've went out to memory here and we've loaded it into our accumulator. That's what load does. So, oh, okay. Some of you might ask, well, why didn't we load it directly into the accumulator? And the reason for that is because in the case here where because remember when we talked about early on, right, we have this cycle of things. So, so to speed things up, something's in the accumulator, maybe getting stored out to memory, right, getting put in the out register. Or getting... <coughs> oh, these are input-output ones. These are not for memory. Sorry, these are not for memory here. These are for input and output. So that would be like your monitor or your mouse or your keyboard. So there was something else in the accumulator that it was using at the time we loaded it. Because loading into from memory takes time. And so we load it ahead of time here so that we can just simply push it there. Because that takes a very little time. It's very quick. <clears throat> okay. Store 
x. Huh, I bet we can figure this one out too, right? The MAR gets x. The MBR gets the accumulator. And these two could be done in parallel or in reverse order. It doesn't matter the order of them. And then the memory location at MAR that gets MBR. The next one we have is add x. And this is x again is a memory location. So the MAR gets x. The MBR gets the memory at MAR. And the accumulator gets accumulator plus MBR. Subtract X. Be exactly the same except for the sign on this one will change to a minus. input the accumulator gets what's ever in that in reg I should probably yeah that's fine so it's gonna whatever's here is gonna go into the Accumulator. That's what that does. Output. You guessed it. The output register gets the accumulator. Halt. This ends the program. Now, how many are there of these? Right, there's sixteen. No. There's nine of them. And we've already gotten to halt at number six. Seven. Skip conditionally. Skip con. Skip cond. Okay.
So re remember, throughout this time, the PC is advancing by one every time we do an instruction. And when I say instruction, I mean the full, the full, the full, like, like load X and store X. And then IR, which again stands for instruction register, this is going to keep track of some things. It's going to help us keep track of some things. So what this does is it looks at the IR, and if the IR... Uh, It looks at the bits in the IR, and if the right bits are zero, it's going to skip in one way, or um, and if they're not, uh, then we're going to skip in a different way. Oh wait, no. Okay. All right. If the IR and it looks at specific bits, so we're not. Gonna, I'm just going to kind of abstract that right now and just say the IR is zero. Then. If the AC oh not equals is less than zero, then program counter equals program counter plus one. So we just go to the next condition. Oh, not equals. I should do this the right way. So we're just going to skip past this. If the IR is 1, and the accumulator is zero, then we advance the program counter. So we're going to do the next thing. Sorry, this should be an else if here. And then we see an else if here. Else if the IR Oh, I should do this differently. So if it's equal to zero zero, if it's equal to zero one is if it's one zero Then we check if the accumulator is strictly greater than zero. What it does 
is it allows us to look at Let me redraw that so it looks better. It allows us to look at what the what the accumulator has in it and what the IR, depending on what the IR comes in with. And and decide whether or not we should skip forward a spot or not. Okay, so <clears throat> what this is going to allow us to do, this allows us to skip. And it's going to, uh, we're going to have a little bit more information on this later as we go. And then the next one here is, the very last one is jump X. And this just simply says the program counter gets X. Ah, because this actually alludes to something we haven't talked about yet. And that is that all of our instructions are actually loaded here in memory. Usually starting at the top and working our way down. So we start here and we work our way down until we reach that halt state. And then we're going to be done. All right, so let me let's bring this over. I want to so notice here. Uh, let me. I'll put this in a in the in the chat so this is a this is a website that actually allows us to uh, to do to put some assembly in and try it out and kind of see what happens with these things as we go okay so let's start out let's say that the second line here let's make that second line what we're going to load and so let's load zero one zero zero and then we're going to add zero one zero one and then we're going to store store that information or store that here in zero one zero two and then we're going to halt. Oh, no, no, no. I think I had it I had it correct before. Okay, so let's go ahead and assemble this. Uh, operator 23 is invalid. No, oh, okay. Actually, what I need to do then is I need to go down here. Okay, so let's go ahead, I'm going to step through this and kind of demo this a little bit here. 
So instead of doing a full step, I'm going to do micro steps. Notice here everything's at zero. So the, the, the PC is at zero. Oh, it's showing me what the, and everything's just at zero. Okay, so, but we look here and see what this, we do a micro step. So remember in a load, the first thing this does is it, oh, it just, it should change the MAR to one, to one zero one four. Why didn't the MAR change? That's interesting. But it did load in to the MBR the thing that was stored. In zero zero. Why is that? That's. Okay, so now the instruction register gets whatever was sitting there. Now we go to the next thing. And notice what happened to our program counter. So let me go back a step. That program counter advanced one here. There we go. So now the MAR gets 104. Something's not right. It's like this isn't working correctly. MBR clears. The accumulator should get a change, and it didn't. Yeah, this isn't working right. We can't use this. Or I'll have to do some more work to make sure that I, get, that I can get it working right. Yeah, I'll have I have to go and, and figure this out. So so I can figure out how this works. Well let's try this one. Okay. Goes to the input. So remember, input does is it takes whatever's in the input and it stores it in the accumulator. Correct? Oh. I'll go back to my one note here and scroll up. Input, yep, puts it in the accumulator. Good. That's what I want. I'm happy about that. All right, so let's go ahead and micro step here. Look, it did. I don't know if we would notice that, but it did. Okay, so then it's going to do a store X. Ah, okay. So it asks for a value. So I'm going to put it in a value of 42 in hexadecimal. Sure. Uh, let's do decimal. So that's 2A, and that's correct. So it put that into the input. It now took the input and put it into the accumulator. So it's a little behind is what's going on. And it, uh, it stored that in X, and in this case X, oh, down here, okay. X is 2A. So x is or x is 
is uh, 0007. There's our MAR telling us where to put it when we did the store. And the MBR is that 2A. So then I micro step again. And now it, the, the program counter has moved on to 2. So it's here. And that is actually the, the micro code. Ah, okay. So it's convert, converted this into machine code. Okay. So then it takes this 5,000. It brings that into MBR. Then it moved to the next thing. And so value, um, in this case, I'm going to say uh, 21. No, no, let's not do 21. Let's do 15. So 15 is F. And that's stored in the input. Do a micro step. And that stores that in the accumulator. Then uh, the MAR changed to the next position. No, don't know why that happened. That's okay. The MBR that change yeah read this in all right so now it's going to do an add x what happened to the accumulator The instructions had changed. That's good. And notice here, it changed. And it added 42 and 15, or 57. If we look up here, that decimal is a 57 now. And that's sitting in the accumulator. And then it halts. It doesn't have to save that out to memory. Because we didn't ask, to, to ask it to. So if you want to, go ahead and go out here and play around a little bit with this. Um, but my guess is most of you will probably be spending your time working on the exam. Uh, well, hopefully that wasn't messed up too much. Uh, okay, so uh, and we'll we'll maybe try to try to do some more work in here and try to figure this out. So uh, maybe it'd be easier. Let me restart it. Let me just do a full step. So right, okay. So this makes maybe makes a little bit more sense. So we go forty two here, and then I do a full step. And that loaded it into memory right here, 2A, because it converts into hexadecimal. And the MAR is 7, which is the location it's sitting at. So then I have to input another value. In this case, I put in a 15. I do another full step. The MAR has moved to 8 now. How does it know to put it in 8? I'm not sure. <laughs> so we'll figure that out. Um, and so then it adds these two together, sticks it in the accumulator, and now it puts it into the output here and re realize it doesn't put it anywhere in the memory. And now we've halted and it stops. So. All right. Well, we will. I'll do another one of these on Wednesday, and then we will go again on, and then Thursday we will. There will not be one because I'll give you guys a little bit more time to to work on your exams. 
So uh, I'm going to log off here. I think I'm going to start the uh, start start grading um, assignment four here. So all right, take care. I will. Uh, I'll. You guys will see me, I guess, in in a couple days. All right. Bye bye.